Welcome to Vote 2017. I'm Teresa Whipple, and today we are speaking with Edmonds School District Board of Directors, District 2 candidate Mitchell Bilo. Hello. Hi, Teresa. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. And we're going to talk a little bit about, um, well, a little bit about a lot of things. Yeah. But first, I'd like you to talk about yourself and why you're running for school board. Okay. Well, you know, um, several years ago, um, when my wife and I moved to this district, we moved here immediately following the birth of our twin daughters who were born 14 weeks premature. And in our time in the NICU, uh, they spent 199 days combined in the NICU. In that time, I saw a lot of uh, parents struggle to meet the needs of their children, to understand the, the medical uh, care that they were receiving, to provide the contact and the involvement that their children needed. And that at that time motiva motivated me to get more involved politically, both to advocate for paid uh, parental and family leave and also to get involved with the March of Dimes to uh, help raise money to prevent premature birth, uh, premature births. And <clears throat> in deciding to run for the school board this year, my son is a first grader at Maplewood. My daughters will be following him in two or three years probably and they're doing fine, but uh, what it occurred to me was that a lot of the challenges that our district faces uh, have parallels in the experience that we had in the NICU, and, and that our school district, like the hospital, has to accept everyone that comes through its doors. They have to provide quality care or quality education. They have to, um, you know, the, the patients that, that have the greatest needs need the most resources, and, um, you know, I feel like our district might need to re revise that and that we need to look at that and um, make sure that we are uh, providing the most resources to the students who have the most needs. Um, so I decided to run for school board because I have a, a lot of a strong vested interest in the performance of the school system uh, because of my children and because I have a, a perspective I think that's needed on the board. Um, both having young children in the school system, but also coming from that environment and uh, having that empathy for families who might not have the advantages that many of the students in our district have. Okay, and I forgot to ask you this earlier when we were talking before the cameras are rolling, and what is your background? Do you have an education background? or? I don't have a background in education. Okay. Uh, I have a, uh, a BA in political science uh -huh. from Ohio State. Um, I have a uh, certificate in editing from the University of Washington. Uh, one of the great things about my career, I think I spent 15 years in retirement plan administration in various roles, and then the past six years I've been doing um, content uh, editing, web editing, for um, primarily for the tech industry, for Nintendo and yeah. Expedia and Microsoft. Um, one of the great things about my career is that it's afforded me many opportunities to learn new things. In fact, I think it's, it's uh, a skill that is perhaps the most important thing to teach our students right now is the skill of how to learn because so often the, the career you plan or the career you end up in right out of high school or right out of college is not the one that you're going to stay in. It's not what you're going to be in 10 years down the road. You have to continue to evolve. You have to continue to learn. And uh, so I have that perspective as well because I am a continual learner. What, uh, if you're elected, what would be maybe the top one or two things you'd like to tackle first? <laughs> well, I if mean... you can narrow it down to two. <laughs> yeah, keeping in mind that, you know, all the decisions that the board made are collective yeah. and, you know, you have to, to build consensus to, to accomplish anything. Um, you know, I think the things that concern me most are the overcrowding in the northern part of the district. Uh, you know, we've heard some very moving stories from teachers at the school board meetings. Uh, the rallies that have happened over the past uh, in August and July um, of classrooms filled you know to the max um, improvised classrooms and hallways um, just outdated facilities um, growth in areas of the district that maybe weren't anticipated uh, as well as they could have been and so the first priority I think is how do we accommodate those students and try and get them back to some level of parity um, with other parts of the district bring down those class sizes. Hire more teachers is an obvious answer, but you have to have somewhere to put them. So that means relocatables, that means you know, possibly uh, having to redraw boundaries around schools or 
uh, you know, in a worst case like busing, most, most people do not uh, want to have their children bused around the district. They prefer a, a neighborhood school or something close to home. So we have to look at how those resources are being allocated um, and how are we addressing those problems. If you look around our community, we see just burgeoning growth on 99. We see it around uh, 44th and Linwood, I-5, where the, the uh, light rail will go. Um, lots of multi-unit development. Um, property values uh, south of us are booming, which is pushing people north, families north, like my own. Um, a lot of longtime residents who have, whose children have left the district are selling. You know, this is an opportune time for them to cash out, and families are moving up here. Um, our enrollment has stayed relatively flat over the past five to ten years, but I don't know that we can count on that. I, I think there are a lot of forces at play that, that might lead to even greater enrollment in our district, and we need to be prepared for it. Yeah, good point. And, you know, as long as you talk a little bit about resources and funding, let's talk about the latest on, you know, the funding front with the McCleary decision and the legislature finally, you know, kind of coming up with something that's a plan that may or may not fly with the Supreme Court. But right. the point is, is that they have presented something. The school districts are looking at it, trying to decide what it all means. Um, if you're elected, you know, kind of how do you think you might approach next steps for school funding? Well, I think at our level, I think what we have to be concerned about first is what what can we spend our new enrichment levy dollars on? We don't know, we don't have a clear definition of what's considered enrichment to the education process and what's basic. Mm -hmm. um, and before we have that, uh, we might have some ideas about where to spend it. Um, for me, I, I'd look at uh, early education. I would love to see more preschool resources. I'd love to see more re reading specialists in the schools. Again, trying to bring parity to those students that don't have the advantages that a lot of them in the district do. Um, at the early ages, it's so important to get students ready to learn. And you know, they have to be in a classroom environment. They have to be, you know, their, their stomachs have to be full of food. They have to have adequate uh, recess time or exercise to be able to focus for the periods of time that they are in the classroom. They need to have, they need to be able to read at grade level. They need to be able to, um, you know, concentrate and have that, have already had that social experience of being in school. It's such uh, an advantage to, to have that. My son had five years of preschool, um, you know, and was, I think, all the better for it. Um, it's a challenge we're going to face with our daughters because we don't have them in preschool and we'll have to figure out ways to give them that kind of experience before they, they get into school. So I'd love to see that uh, happen in our district. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we don't know what the Supreme Court's going to rule. It's interesting that, you know, the, the legislature passed the budget. Um, people in the, uh, we had uh, Senator Frocht and um, I'm, I'm blanking on the Republican who also had to write mm -hmm. the brief to the court defending the, legisl uh, the legislation that they'd passed or the budget that they'd passed. But we also had some 40 legislators write a letter saying that they didn't think that this was adequate. Um, so people have had to kind of wear both hats. And I, I think that ultimately it, w you know, it will come down to the legislature having to find new sources of revenue. But until that time, we have a lot of challenges on our side. It's the enrichment levy. It's, uh, you know, what effect is the property tax cap going to have on our district? We know already that we're going to be a net, uh, we're going to lose funds relative to other districts uh, on the whole. Um, so how, um, how are we going to cope with those challenges? Um, and what will we focus our, our resources on? And, and um, you know, I, I think that there, there are a lot of, a lot of question marks still about that. Okay. Uh, talk a little bit about another issue that seems to be at the forefront in recent years, and that is just how much the demographics of the school district has changed and mm -hmm. is a very diverse district compared to how it used to be, you know, 10 years ago when mm -hmm. my kids were in school. Um, what uh, kinds of things do you think the district is doing well in terms of a, kind of adapting to that changing population? What mm -hmm. do you think they could do better? And you know, you and I were talking earlier about kind of one of the things that really put a spotlight on it was last year in Madrona, mm -hmm. at Madrona School, when they had a couple of issues with swastikas and racial hate 
messages on you know some parts of the school that really I think just shook a lot of people up and um, you know what what do you think the district you know should be looking out for when it comes to those kinds of issues well you know I, I my son's been in the district for a year and is just beginning his second year so I don't have the history with our current board or and of course we had Dr. McDuffie come in last mm -hmm. year replacing Dr. Brossett so um, I don't have a uh, the, the long-term view of what the district has done well or yeah. how it's changed. But on a personal level, what I, I talked with my principal at Maplewood because Maplewood, um, you know, it's a lottery school. Um, it tends to be uh, parents who have a lot of time to devote to their children's education. We love volunteering in the classroom. Yeah. The teaching environment is fantastic. Um, but, you know, it's been criticized as not being diverse enough over the past few years. So I talked with my principal about that. Um, Michelle Mathis and um, they made some changes to the lottery for one thing they made it you know they um, now instead of just throwing all the, ap the applicants into one pool they draw from four different quadrants around the district um, you know I've seen it it actually came as kind of a shock to me because in my son's class and in classes uh, near his um, I saw a diverse array of students so I was a little surprised to find out that it was out of sync with the rest of the district mm -hmm. But um, I think we also need to, at, at least at, at our school, I mean, we need to uh, do what we can to better um, advertise the lottery and make parents uh, of diverse backgrounds become, uh, feel more from, uh, comfortable when they come in to tour the school, um, let them know that diversity is valued and that we, we want their experiences in our classroom. Um, so that's at that level. At the district level, I think, um, you know, I, I, had the, uh, I had the pleasure of getting the endorsement of the Edmund, Edmonds Education Association earlier this week, or last week, I'm sorry, and um, the question came up there as well. <clears throat> and I think, you know, as our district is, the composition of, of students is changing, we also need to change the composition of faculty, you know, and, you know, a lot, oftentimes what you'll hear administrators say is that we need to attract and retain the best uh, teachers or you know the teachers that fit what we're looking for in our district but I think that's a little too passive I think we actually have to be a little more aggressive about recruiting um, teachers uh, diverse faculty to our school system um, you know we we do have a changing population it's important I think for students to see teachers that have shared uh, experiences with them or, or you know look like them it, it's not the only thing that's important, but it, it, it's a huge thing for our district. Uh, I also think because we have this diverse population of students and we have a good school system, we should do what we can within our school system to, you know, shepherd the next generation of teachers into colleges and universities around uh, around Washington, and hopefully they come back and teach in our district. That we hear a lot about a teacher shortage, um, you know, not just here, but you know, around the country, and you know, getting. If we have a diverse student population, what can we do to encourage some of them to go into teaching as well and hopefully come back and teach in our district? Well, you mentioned the Madrona incident. Yeah. I, I just would like to say about that, um, you know, it was incredibly disturbing. And I think that when we have um, an incident like that or multiple incidents happen within our district, it's an attack on all of us. It's, a, it's an attack on the values that our community holds dear. And we don't have the luxury in this current political climate in our country to just assume that this was a prank or, and we don't know. And, and if we don't rally around those schools and those students and, you know, positively state what our values are, inform our parents in a timely manner when those uh, incidents occur, um, bring in our community to, um, to speak to values different than that. If we don't answer that, then that's a seed that's planted in potentially in one or more students' heads. And, and I, don't, I don't want that to become a problem in our district, so. Okay, thanks. Let's talk about one other very um, uh, hot button, I guess is a good word, issue that's happened in the last year or two, um, and that is um, the crumb rubber play fields that mm -hmm. um, the board has had before it a couple of times and um, 
started actually in Edmonds with a school where they were going to put in some crumb rubber ground up tires, basically crumb rubber, mm -hmm. uh, infill on a play field and parents started looking into it, discovered there were some possible health and environmental concerns. Uh, came down to, you know, City of Edmonds put a ban on those fields, at least for now, at least through February, but the district you know, kind of has control over a lot of the decisions related to that, and the board look at looked at it and voted, you know, a couple of times in different areas to continue on with, with that infill. Um, have you had a chance to research that issue? And yes. Do you have thoughts? Good. Yes, Tell I me have. what they are. Um, well, I, I think first, as a district, we have a responsibility to first do no harm to our students, to our community. Um, we need to know that the decisions we make aren't going to have long-term effects, negative effects on our children and on our environment. Um, you know, I read through the report that was commissioned by the school board uh, that was looking for, you know, evidence of uh, health, health issues arising from the use of crumb rubber, um, and it was inconclusive. Um, unfortunately, a, a lot of those types of studies don't have the benefit of hindsight. It takes years for those effects to, to manifest and um, so you know I think I would tread very carefully before I considered putting crumb, ru crumb rubber in on a field when there are other alternatives that might be safer or might have less long-term negative impact you know when my wife and I were searching for homes um, you know we deliberately avoided homes that were adjacent to the interstate because of the exhaust fumes and because of the medical research done that indicates that that has negative uh, health benefits to um, to children especially um, but um, and that's the, the exhaust fumes are the same things that those tires are absorbing it's the carbon black I mean, it's a known toxin I think we would have to tread very carefully before we we approved any more of those okay very good well now is an opportunity for you to address the voters directly and oh. tell them why they um, should vote for you so please do that now I'm Mitchell Bilo, and I'm running for the Edmonds School Board, position two. Um, I am running because as a parent and as a member of this community, I want to give our voters a choice in this election. Uh, something you may not be aware of is that this position has not had a contested election since 1993. Lou Pinello was in his second year as manager of the Mariners back then. And I, I think that I represent uh, I better represent the values of this district. Uh, and, and I also, because I have children uh, at a young age who are entering the school system, I have a different perspective on the school system. Uh, I can bring in new ideas uh, that come from my background, uh, my professional background in retirement plan administration and in working in the tech industry. I have an understanding of what uh, today's companies are looking for in, uh, in their employees and I would really like to bring that perspective to the school board um, to, and represent all of the not just the parents and children in our district but all of the voters and all of the citizens in our district um, who need our school system to be run effectively and governed well um, and to provide a safe and supportive environment for all of the children in our district. Thank you. Mitchell Bilo, thank you so much for coming in. I wish you the best of success. Thank you very much, Teresa. Yeah. Thank you.